How long are you here for this time? Oh, I'm here until the end of this month. Okay. Yeah. Is the first in person? Yeah, yeah. Check, check, check. So. Mm -hmm. so we mm -hmm. People, more people show up, or yeah. less people. Or people that have gotten used to yeah, having the abil <laughs> ability to mute you, turn the video. <laughs> Even like well, well, less people, people having the ability, <laughs> ability to mute you, turn the video. <laughs> I'm uh, even like I'm more doing less people doing the last one that's <laughs> next week yeah. having the yeah. ability to mute you <laughs> turn the video <laughs> see back they were given the choice so only around 60 percent have come back so those were the hardest you know, most difficult to do everything you know what do you do with the labs all these videos of labs and what you need it was about yeah by the end of the, uh, of the semester. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, even like well, I'm more doing less people. The last one that's the next week. Yeah. Having the ability, yeah. <laughs> ability to mute you, yeah. turn the video. done the whole of his 11th and 12th oh, pretty much online. It's, when he goes to college, it's going to be a bit of a, a change. That, that said, I think MSc and, and, and the calling, calling to make sure that uh, Good to know it was working to some degree. I believe it's all getting back to normal now. hospitalizations or not that's the only thing people yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly why I mean, the UK's yeah. policy now is as long as people aren't going to hospital they really don't care you just have to deal with it
seen them very much. So. I've only seen Rajesh Singh at the back lecture theatre. I haven't had a chance to see it. A lot colder. <laughs> Maybe too cold. <laughs> Kekwan, hello. Hello. Kekda. Korda. Hello, check one, two, hello. Pikorda, here the He did. Mic check. Um, One, two, hello. Yeah, he upgraded. Yeah, he upgraded okay, with hello, Arda. Okay. Hello.
Um, on behalf of the Physics Colloquium Committee, I welcome you all to this semester's in-house colloquium lecture. Uh, our speaker for today is Professor Jim Libby, uh, who is going to talk about flavor physics at the intensity flirt, uh, frontier at Bell 2, uh, with very promising physics prospects indeed. Uh, Professor Libby is an experimental particle physicist in the Department of Physics here at IOTM. Uh, he received his doctorate from the University of Oxford, working in electrophys uh, electric physics with the Delphi experiment at CERN. Since then, he has worked primarily on flavor physics, focusing on the measurements of matter-antimatter asymmetry uh, in the bottom and charm hadron decays, uh, as well as uh, on rare decays and instrumentation. He has held research positions at Stanford, uh, CERN, and the University of Ox Oxford, while working on various experiments like LHCB, Babar, and CLIOC. Uh, he has been a member of the IOTM faculty since 2009, working primarily on Bell and Bell II experiments located at Keiki, Japan. Uh, on which we shall be hearing extensively from him in today's lecture. So without any further delay, let us welcome Dr. Libby on stage. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. So thank you very much, Anita, for the introduction. Um, so it's a very novel experience I'm having. I don't actually remember seeing this many people and speaking to them for a very long time. Um, but I know you're just here for the cake, so it's, uh, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. Um, but I, I'm going to continue the uh, culinary theme slightly by talking about flavor physics. Um, and I have to sort of spend a bit of time really defining what these two things are, what flavor physics is and the intensity frontier before I'll talk about the Bell II experiment. So just to give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about, first of all, I'm going to introduce this idea of frontiers and how we're tackling problems in particle physics today. And then I'm going to talk about flavor physics in particular, what it is, what it's done in terms of um, establishing the standard model of particle physics, and particularly its role in predicting things that are found at a later date, and I'll explain that in more detail. Then, if there's a bell too, there was a bell. And I will tell you about the bell experiment briefly and the principal thing that it discovered or, or, or is famous for, which is CP violation. It's something that we work on here in IIT Madras as well, and I'll show you more results about that later on. And then, this is a little bit more for the experts. Anyone who knows about flavor physics knows there's a very successful experiment at CERN that is also doing flavor physics. And I want to just try and describe to you a little bit of what's special about Bell II in comparison to LHCB and what we like to refer to as a very friendly rivalry as the complementarity. And then just at the close of the talk, I'll show some current highlights of the measurements that we are making. And those relate to these three topics, which I'll explain as I go through. And of course, the one that may be of most interest is these so-called anomalies that we're seeing which may be an indication of some breaking in the standard model. OK. So any talk about particle physics, one should start by looking at our current best paradigm, which is the standard model. And this is the particle content of everything we know about in the universe. So we have up here the quarks, and down here the leptons. And then on this side, we have what we call the gauge bosons, which mediate the different forces. So the quarks feel the strong force, the quarks and the charged leptons feel the electromagnetic force, and then all of them feel the weak force, which is the W and the Z down here. And off to the side was the last big news in particle physics, which is the discovery of the Higgs boson, which gives mass essentially to these uh, gauge bosons down here, and in turn can give mass to the massive fermions as well. So flavor physics is a description of these quarks, these three generations of quarks, up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. So we think of those names as flavors. And the flavors uh, physics is talking about the interactions between these quarks, which happens just through the weak interaction. So this weak interaction is special because it communicates between the different flavors. The strong and the electromagnetic force just communicate with one type of particle at a time. Um, of course, there's flavor also in the leptons that these electron, muon, and tau also the lepton flavors. But what I'm primarily going to talk about is quark flavor. So this is an extremely successful model. And to 
show that, I'll show you the number of Nobel Prizes that this model has been awarded over the years. So it's been 50 years in the making, and uh, I could go through these exhaustively, but for various discoveries along the way of certain particles, paradigms of the model, so this is uh, Glashow, Salam, Weinberg, uh, and, and Tehuft and Feldman, uh, and then, of course, going up to the Higgs boson and the symmetry breaking. So most other areas of physics gets very frustrated that particle physics has been rewarded so much for one thing. But it's essentially got very few uh, experimental flaws that we can find in the laboratory, but we know it's not a final theory of particle physics. And, and, and there are certain problems with it, particularly one that's actually well known and, and, and has been around for a while, that the neutrinos are massive, and that cannot be incorporated within the standard model of particle physics. And that has already been awarded a Nobel Prize for that observation. So uh, Kajita San, who spoke, I think, last semester, uh, was awarded that along with Art MacDonald. So there are other things, usually coming from cosmology, that we now know about. There's dark matter in the universe. There's dark energy. I can't tell you much about that. I don't think anyone can. And there's much more matter than antimatter in the universe. That is something that is related to my talk, though, again, we probably don't have the solution in quark flavor physics. And of course, there's gravity that stands outside the standard model. Now, there are aesthetic problems with the standard model as well. And um, those are things that theorists like to talk about a great deal and try and come up with a better theory. For example, why do we have three generations of these quarks and leptons? That's an arbitrary number. Why not four? Why not two? Why not five? The model is very empirical. We have measured 18 parameters that go into it to high accuracy in some cases. But why do we need all these parameters and why do they have such a distinctive hierarchy is not well understood. And as an example of this, there are certain parameters, particularly the Higgs mass and electroweak couplings that have to be tuned to the 18th decimal place, which is a highly unnatural thing to do to get the model to be stable. Because we can't measure to that level, but we just need the numbers to work out. And there are solutions beyond the standard model physics which will solve many of these things. And of course, the ultimate goal is to unify all the forces together. We've managed three. Why not include gravity as well? So how we tackle these outstanding problems is in terms of frontiers or experimental frontiers. And there are three of these. One is energy, one is cosmic, and one is intensity. And I'll briefly describe the energy in the cosmic before moving to the intensity one. So this is the energy frontier. This ghastly looking plot I won't ask you questions about. But what it's saying is we've looked for an extension of the standard model, something called supersymmetry, which may well be familiar to many of you, where a boson has a fermion partner and a fermion has a boson partner. And these are limits set by the Atlas experiment at the LHC, uh, which is colliding together protons at the highest energies we've managed in a collider at 13 TeV. And they haven't found anything, but they set a limit of many TeV on some of these particles, or several TeV. So that's the energy frontier. The cosmic frontier, we know there's dark matter out there. And so, for example, there are searches for the dark matter that should be passing through all of us all the time as we go around in our solar system and in our galaxy. And this is a plot showing various experiments that do very precise measurements, looking for tiny signals that could come from one of these dark matter particles, which are not interacting electromagnetically, might be interacting a little weakly with nuclei. And you can see their um, signatures. And they set limits down to some very, very small numbers in terms of cross sections down here to 10 to the minus 46. And essentially, we haven't seen anything yet, apart from some strange observations here, which are not borne out by other experiments. So there's no direct detection of dark matter. That's a kind of cosmic frontier experiment. You can also do things with cosmic rays and uh, cosmic neutrinos and gamma rays and things like this. So I move to the intensity frontier. The intensity frontier is about making precise measurements and looking for very rare things. So we have to produce billions of particles to do this. So it's all about high precision. So a current example of this, which has quite uh, been in the news last year, is this thing called a mu, which is the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. So this is being measured by a, a very intricate experiment at Fermilab in America, this so-called FNLA G minus 2. And we can predict this 
essentially the coupling of a, a, a muon with a photon, considering all the higher order corrections very, very precise. And doing this, we see that this is offset by 4.2 standard deviations. This is quite significant. However, not everyone, I'm, not, I'm telling you a partial story here because there are other theory predictions that sit much closer to this using an entirely different technique of prediction. So, but this is the kind of thing we do. We make precise measurements and we compare it to precise predictions. If there's any tension, that means there's something that wasn't on my first slide. There's something beyond the standard model that has come and changed the results that we see. So... Complicate. Okay, I could spend, this is a different talk. Um, so this number, the, the, this bar here is a statistical one, so they will take more statistics and this will shrink. This piece is the systematic contribution, which they can also shrink, shrink with more statistics. So this band will get smaller. The questions about the theory predictions, there are experimental inputs, which myself and Gaurav are now working on here in IIT Madras. Um, but that's, a, again, a different talk, which can help to understand if this is wrong. Uh, but there's also lattice QCD predictions that have to be made, and they have to be reconciled with one another. It's going to be a long time uh, to, to, to figure this out. It's going to be several years. But it's, uh, you know, so, so you'd be brave to say this is really a sign of new physics, but the current best guess is it's disagreeing. So back to flavor. Um, basically, flavor measurements can say something about virtually all of these problems, apart from dark energy and gravity. So maybe Sri Ram will lose interest and walk out now. But um, the, the, this, all these other problems we can actually address in some way or another using the Bell 2 experiment and making flavor physics measurements. I can't describe all of this today, but I'm just giving you a sense of what we're trying to do here when we're making these measurements. So to motivate further, I want to give some history of flavor physics and bring us up to the Bell experiment. So, as many of you may have remember when you were studying particle physics, we have all these particles. You have to remember what they're made up of and this, these various diagrams that we have. But that was relatively ordered compared with what was there in the 1950s where the same particle had two different names and there was no real structure to what was going on. So it came to something called the quark model by Gelman and others who suggested there were three quarks, the up, down, and the strange. And, and with that, they could describe most of the things that they were seeing in terms of those light particles, light quark particles that, 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 that were there, the pions and the kaons. But there were anomalies. This particular particle over here, this k-long, um, is made up of a strange and anti-down quark. And to good precision, they could predict that it must decay to two muons at some rate. And they kept looking for this. This is a really easy thing to see in our experiments, but they didn't see it. So to look at this in the quiet model picture, our, our modern view of particle physics, what you have is this strange quark and anti-down quark exchanging an up quark between them, then producing two W bosons in this box here. So these particles are virtual. So they don't necessarily have to have the rest mass energies of all the particles involved here. But then those Ws coupled to leptons, on the other side and produce your muon pair. So this was predicted, but not seen, an idea of an anomaly. So how was this resolved? So these three gentlemen, Glashow, Iliopoulos, and Miami, gym mechanism, as it's called. So I will tell an anecdote now. It's about time in the talk, 15 minutes in. So I, I heard this uh, story, one of the many shocking stories about Donald Trump that you hear, that, um, his staff were having a problem getting him to concentrate. That bit is easy to believe, right? But what they found helped was they put his name into any documents. They say, Donald Trump this, Donald Trump that, and he'd take an interest if it was about him. So this takes me to my second year particle physics lectures at university. And someone somewhere mentioned the gym mechanism. I perked up, I listened, and here I am today, um, <laughs> 30 years later, telling you about particle physics. So, you know, maybe <laughs> that's probably the, hopefully the only thing I have in common with Donald Trump. Um, so back to the gym mechanism and my anomalous decay here. So how it was solved by, the, by Glashow and all was they predicted a fourth quark, the charm quark. And if you put that into this box, 
have these two potential ways to make this final state now. So once you sum these two probabilities together and square them, you'll get the total rate. Now, the trick was that there's this thing called the Kibibo angle, which I'll define on the next slide, which comes that uh, varies the rate of, of, of coupling between the strange and the up quark and the strange and the charm quark and the down and the up. And what you find is that these particular uh, couplings that come the lower diagram has an overall sign difference with this one. So these two diagrams end up having opposite sign. If the masses were identical, it would be identically zero. But the interference between these two diagrams is essentially suppressing the rate. So by, by their intuition, they realize that something else must be there to explain this anomaly that they were seeing. So eventually, it was measured. Um, and the rate actually could tell you about what the mass of this charm quark was. It could infer what it was. Even though the charm quark was very much heavier, three times heavier than the kaon, they could predict it was around one and a half GeV. And then at Slack and Brookhaven, they discovered it a few years later. So this is what these rare virtual processes can tell us about things that we don't know about. And that's really the story that we're carrying on today, is we look for these small deviations and think of ways that new physics could be changing them. This brings me now to CP violation, which is a big theme of some of the results I'll show you, and also why Bell and Bell 2 exist. So again, things you will have learned, weak interaction has this odd property that it can tell the difference between left and right. It's parity violating. And that was established in the 1950s after Li and Yang predicted this by Wu. So that's most readily shown in terms of the standard model of particle physics by considering a neutrino. So this is a neutrino moving to the right here, and this is its spin. And all neutrinos are left-handed. That means spin is anti-aligned to their direction of motion. So if I operate on this with the parity operator, what I find is that the momentum changes direction. That's a regular polar vector. But the spin, which is analogous to the cross product of a uh, an angular momentum, cross product of a position and a velocity, does not. It's an axial vector. So what you end up with is a right-handed neutrino, which doesn't exist. So that's a clear example of the parity of violation that's there within the standard model. And it's related to the neutrino because it's related, to, that's the only the particle that only couples to the weak interaction. But then people thought, oh, maybe this is not so bad. We can add charge conjugation to this. So this is this charge conjugation operator which just converts the quantum numbers of the, the particle. In particular, it turns an, an antimatter particle into a matter particle and vice versa. So what one gets here is an antineutrino, which is right-handed. And that is what we do observe in nature. So the CP transformation takes you from the neutrino to the antineutrino naturally. So CP was thought to be a good symmetry of nature. But then, not so long afterwards, in 1964, a famous experiment by Cronin and Fitch showed that you could have a, a, a known state of a certain CP decaying to something opposite. And this is CP violation, a difference between a, a violation of this symmetry, which converts, in fact, because this relates together matter and antimatter, to a difference between matter and antimatter, which is essential somehow to build up this imbalance that's there in the universe. Unfortunately, what we see in the standard model is nine orders of magnitude too small, so we need new sources of CP violation. So this effect was described within the standard model by another prediction in flavor physics. So this two-by-two two mixing matrix, which I'd already talked about in terms of this Kibibo angle, is mixing together the weak interaction and the mass eigenstates, the weakly interacting eigenstates and the mass eigenstates at the down and the strange quarks using this two by two unitary matrix, couples to the up and the charm quarks. So what Kobayashi and Maskawa realized, this was before we'd even discovered the charm quark, that you needed a third generation. You needed the top and the bottom quark, and you extend this matrix to something called the CKM matrix, which has all these different elements that describes the coupling between, say, the up and the beauty quark here, this VUB element, which I'll come back to. And that can explain CP violation because this unitary matrix can be described in terms of four parameters and five trivial phases, which get absorbed into these mass, uh, these fields of the quarks here. 
So you just need four parameters. So you have three mixing angles now, like the Kibibo angle, but you have one imaginary phase. And this imaginary phase is of different sign for matter and antimatter particles, and hence can generate the CP violation. Unfortunately, why I'm saying it's so small is because this only really happens for, for these elements that are coupling together the third and the first generation. And if you look at the magnitude of the size of these elements of this matrix, it's strongly diagonal with only small couplings between the generations. So what this means is a up quark likes to couple to a top, a down quark, a top quark likes to couple to a beauty quark, and it doesn't like to couple to another generation. So anyway, this CP violating phase was predicted, and they also predicted two new quarks, which turned out to be discovered many years later. So this is again an example of flavor predicting. So I want to talk a little bit more about the CP violation now, and um, we look at this uh, CKM matrix in a particular expansion, so-called Wolfenstein parameterization, where we expand in powers lambda, which is just sine of this Kibibo angle. And uh, there are terms up here which are higher order, which we won't worry about. And you see these complex numbers here. As I said, they're the ones between the first and the third generation, VUB and VTD, which contain information about the complex phase. So you exploit unitarity of this matrix. You have to conserve the number of quarks. And in particular, one looks at the first and the third columns. And here you write down a relationship between the element and, it, and the charge conjugate of another. And because these must be the zero terms in our identity matrix, they, they, they're the three imaginary numbers which sum to zero. So in the argand plane, this is just a triangle. So each of these uh, components on the left-hand side of this expression can be viewed as a, a, a vector in the argand diagram, and they must close together to give zero. And this is the so-called unitarity triangle, which is the way that we uh, visualize the amount of CP violation in the standard model. Now, um, this, uh, this means that we can measure the angles of these triangles uh, and measure the lengths of the sides, and we can over-constrain or look in great detail at what's going on with CP violation. Uh, there's a bit of confusion in our field. Some people like to call these angles phi 1, phi 2, and phi 3. Other people like to call them alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, and if you work for a Japanese experiment, you're expected to call them phi, because it's the Japanese like to call them that. But you can see how you can get these angles by looking at the ratios of the sides, and you can get the arguments, and you can see how they're related back to this parameterization. So a lot of effort went on uh, over the recent years to try and measure these, this triangle very precisely. And this is, these are the current results, but again gives the indication of why we want to measure these things better. So this is the current knowledge of the unitarity triangle by just measuring things where you don't have any loops, what we call tree diagrams. So I'll come back to this later. But you can compare it to where you have loops, and as I've mentioned before with K0 mu mu, loops tend to give you new things because you can have heavy new particles in these loops which you haven't actually directly produced in the laboratory before. So you can actually see that the apex of this triangle, which is telling you uh, about the amount of CP violation, if this triangle had zero area, there'd be no CP violation, um, it's not well known directly. We have to rely on all these loop measurements. So what we're trying to do is improve the measurements here to see if there's any tension between these two, and there is scope for considerable tension between these, a few degrees difference in the measurement of these angles. So again, this is an example of these kind of precision measurements that we're trying to do, which may tell us something about other sources of CP violation beyond the standard model. Okay, so before moving to Bell 2, I must say something about... On the standard model theories like to say there's no new CP violation because it makes life difficult for them for other, other observations. Um, so most people favor that the new CP violation is there in the neutrino sector. So there's this equivalent matrix, this PMNS matrix, which could, if that has CP violation in it, could explain things. But it's, if, if we have a new theory, if our current theory already has this mixing between the quarks, there should be new sources of CP violation. You can con continually add phases if you've got a three by three or four by four structure that some of these things have. So it's, it, there's, there's prejudice one way or the other if you like 
one theory. Some people like an extra generation. Some people like supersymmetry and no CP violation. It's a, we have to measure it. So, Bell. Um, so, what this is, is an experiment that collides together electrons and positrons, the E plus is the positron, the antimatter electron, at a particular resonance called the Upsilon 4S, which contains a beauty quark and an anti-beauty quark. And this decays almost exclusively to a pair of B mesons, which is a B quark and a light quark. So either um, a B minus, which would be a B quark and an anti-up quark, or a B zero bar, which is a B quark and an uh, anti-down quark. And we use these primarily for measurements of CKM and also to search for rare decays. I didn't write that here. It has a special feature that there's an asymmetric energy between the electron and the positron. The electron is uh, faster than the positron, and that boosts the, the, the center of mass frame. So these B mesons are moving in our lab frame. And because of this, and because they have a relatively long lifetime of 1.2 picoseconds, which doesn't sound very long, but that means that they travel a macroscopic distance, which we can measure before they decay from when they're produced. Whereas something that decaying strongly will have a lifetime of 10 to the minus 20 seconds or so. So we can exploit this, and it allows us to make time-dependent measurements. Again, I won't go into the details of this because I'm not showing any of that today. I won't talk about coherent production. But this E plus, E minus environment, it's, it's important to understand why we're not doing some of this at the LHC. When you bang together protons you get lots and lots of particles. When you, you back together electrons and positrons at low energy, this is only 10 GeV compared with 13 TeV, you get very few. On average, we get between 8 to 10 particles. It means that we can do very precise reconstruction. We can reconstruct everything and even measure the missing particles like neutrinos. So, so Bell 2 runs with 7 and 4 GeV for the electron and positron, respectively. So, uh, no, no, two separate beam pipes. So, so it's a separate lattice for each one, magnetic lattice. Sure, oh, Raj. So, So for, for, the, for the weak interaction, because the strength of the coupling is so small. Okay. So any, it's, like a, it's like QED, right? So it's QED actually suppressed further because of the mass of the W. Right. So, so higher order weak corrections are essentially negligible. Um, higher order electromagnetic corrections, you can start to worry about those in certain processes. We do worry about alpha QED squared type corrections. Right. For the strong interaction, you're screwed, right? Because alpha S is of order one, particularly at low momentum transfer, and then you have to sum to all orders, and you can't actually make the perturb perturbative expansion. So uh, Q QCD is a problem in many of the measurements that we have, because it's hard to predict. So we devise ways to measure the relevant parameters and essentially have them as nuisance parameters and extract them in our fits, because we don't, we, we, we don't want to be reliant on calculations. So, so, um, so s for extracting certain things from B physics, um, particularly the magnitudes of these CKM matrix elements, VUB and VCB in particular, we rely on pre precise calculations of the form factors of the B transitioning into a lighter meson, which can be done on the lattice. However, there is great distrust of the lattice because it's very hard. And so we have to find ways of calibrating the lattice as well. So there is, um, it's, it's no, not, I, I say distrust, but it's because these calculations are so intensive com computationally, and to discretize space and time more and more, it's incredibly difficult. And, um, but, but they're improving all the time, and we hope to get a few percent precision based upon lattice calculations on the length of the sites. But it, again, that's not coming later. Yeah, they're ab initio calculations, which basically they discretize this lattice, right? And then how they actually do the 
calculations, I'm not the right person, but some of it will be Monte Carlo integrations, some of it will be analytic, and it's a combination of these. And I know there are things that they have problems with, they have to do it all with certain masses and then extrapolate to the real masses later on because you have to do it in a chiral way with things essentially zero mass. It's, it's a minefield, but we should get someone to come and speak about lattice QCD because it's a very interesting topic. Okay. Uh, I think I'm doing okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm about halfway through and halfway through the time. Um, so yeah, go, going back to this clean environment, we have this detector up here, which is the Bell detector, which encloses where the particles collide in here, and then we have these sort of uh, cylindrical layers which measure different properties of the particles. So there are some that measure the, where they decay very precisely, some measure the momentum, others manage, measure the electromagnetic energy, and then if, uh, if a particle escapes the whole thing, it's likely to be a charged particle, that is, it's likely to be a muon, so you have muons outside. And we have specialized detectors to tell the difference between pions and kaons. This is by PID here. So these experiments, there was Bell, there was also Babar in America. Um, they had problems with their accelerator, and they didn't ac accumulate as much data as Bell. Um, and they stopped somewhat earlier here in 2008, whereas Bell went on to 2010. With this data, uh, they did uh, several things. I can't go through all of this. I want to highlight this Nobel Prize up here, which was for Kobayashi and Muskawa, uh, because we measured the triangle very precisely and showed that their description of CP violation in the standard model was correct. And then uh, this is to give you an example of the diversity of the measurements that we make. Um, and then I want to talk about anomalies a bit later. And one of these is the success in this B decay to a charm meson, a tau, and a muon. And this is what's causing some excitement in flavor physics in particular and particle physics in general today. So, um, and then just to go back to things I said earlier, that we can even search for light dark matter in our collisions and things, and this is what these first searches were done, and we're going to make them much more precisely at Bell 2. So, to put in context Bell 2, I just wanted to spend a little bit on LHCB. I won't go into detail on this. This is an experiment, at the, obviously, at the LHC, which is collides together its protons here, and then it instruments a small forward region as everything is boosted into their acceptance. And this is because the pieces of the proton that collide, which are essentially the gluons, have differing momentums, whether they're traveling from the left or the right, and so they're always boosted in some way. Um, and, and by doing this, you often get both B quarks in the acceptance, and they can make measurements, and they have all the same things. They have precise tracking, particle identification, muon detectors, and tracking and into measurement. And they have been very successful in the last decade. Uh, they've trillions of B mesons compared with the billions that I'm going to be talking about. So they have a huge statistical advantage. Um, but they have issues in that they collide together things at 40 megahertz but you can only read this out at a few kilohertz, so they lose a lot of data. This will change in their upgrade. They're going to try and read everything out at 40 megahertz. But um, they, they've been very, very successful. They, they're the ones who've discovered some of the anomalies. They've discovered many new particles in spectroscopy. These are new states of bound quarks, and they've made the most precise measurements of the unitarity triangle now. So we're trying to play catch up. But L2, in essence, is you can't have too much of a good thing. Bell was very successful, leading to this Nobel Prize for KM. So we're trying to integrate a data sample 50 times larger so we can make more precise measurements and also search for rarer and rarer decays. But you must ask yourself, if there are a trillion bees in Geneva, why are you trying to do this in Japan? So in this big table here, you sh I'm trying to show the complementarity between these two experiments. A lot of these terms are a little technical, one thing you can see is that we're trying to greatly increase our luminosity here, but we don't, Bell HCB doesn't have to do that because they have a huge cross section, which is 150,000 times larger than Bell for producing BB bar pairs. But we have this low background level. We have very good reconstruction of neutral particles, particularly a pi zero, which decays to two photons. This LHCB event, which I didn't talk about here, you see how messy it is. There are tens of particles coming out here. 
and it's quite hard, and all these clusters in the calorimeter, it's very hard to reconstruct things unless, like here, there's a pair of muons that you can see clearly, which are becoming a beam, coming from a beam. They can do this uh, well if it's fully reconstructed. So if it's all charged tracks, they, their boost is enormous. So it actually flies like a centimeter or so before it decays. And they have a very precise silicon detector, and they can see very clearly the, dec the decay point. And, and that gets rid of a lot of the background that's coming from the underlying proton-proton collision. But as soon as you've got a neutrino or a pi zero, they have lots of problems. They are making ni nice measurements using those modes, but in principle, we should do them better. OK? That's really coming back to our strengths. We have this, this well-known kinematic, so we can measure the neut neutrino, and we can measure these neutrals. Um, and something, again, I won't talk about, when you produce B quarks, you're also producing lots of tau leptons, and you're also producing lots of charmed particles as well. And there's lots of interesting physics you can do with those. I'll show one, one result from charm. So you have many different things that you can do. So these complement each other. So for, for things with all charged tracks, LHCB will always lead the way. They're going to run through into the 2030s. But we have lots of other things to do which are complementary. And I'll give an example with a very final thing that I show about that. So this expression here. Um, is how we uh, define our luminosity. How we get to 50 times higher is to increase the luminosity of our accelerator. This is essentially a parameter of the machine that you multiply with the cross-section to give you the total number of events that you expect. And this luminosity relates to lots of quantities here, which uh, I won't try and explain in too much detail, uh, but I'll highlight a couple of these. One is kind of obvious. If your beams contain more current, you'll get more collisions. So you just try and increase the current here. The less, this one is less obvious. It's called the vertical beta function. But essentially, it's the vertical size of the beam. So if you can squeeze the size down of the beam and get more and more electrons and positrons in a small space with high current, you'll get more interactions. And how we try and tackle this is by reducing this beta function to boost the luminosity and increase the currents. But there's a real limit on how much you can increase the current because as an electron accelerates around, it's always radiating photons. This synchrotron radiation would actually be so intense that it would melt the beam pipe. So we have to, if we were just going to say, OK, we're going to boost it by a factor of 10. So what, what's been done, I wouldn't say we, because it's some very clever people from Italy and Japan who've done this, is to reduce this beta star function. So this cartoon down here is showing how a bunch of positrons and electrons interacted with one another in Keck B, which was Bell's experiment. So that's all two sort of ellipsoids that go through one another, and you get your collisions formed here. But how we're doing this at Super Keck B is we're reducing the size of this interaction region to a very small level, particularly in the vertical direction. This is this beta star parameter. And we're going to increase this beta star parameter by a factor of 20 or so. Um, and this is our big challenge, is to make these bunches. And there's lots of fancy magnets that go into making these sort of hourglass shapes of the bunches of particles so that they cross in this very, uh, very small region here. And, and, and we've, we've established this. I don't have the plots here, but we can measure the interaction regions much smaller now at, at, at Super Keck B. So no, the, the, these, the, these, these, these collide straight, but there is a beam-beam interaction. This is this beam-beam parameter up here, which I haven't talked about, which you, you have to try and keep that as large as possible. Otherwise, your luminosity degrades. And it's to do with, um, now you've asked, it's to do with something called the emittance, which is how well contained the beams are in their phase space. And if you, you, so you want them as narrowly confined in phase space as possible. You want the smallest emittance. And that allows you then to do all of this without too much perturbation. But if you have too diffuse and too wide a range of different momenta in terms of the beams, you have lots of problems because you're trying to contain particles with very different parameters in phase space. So you need to really reduce the phase space of the beams to be able to do this. Synchrotron radiation here is not a problem because they're in these, this bit's in a straight line. Okay? It's only in the curves of the machine where we get lots of synchrotron radiation. 
There's blow-up effects. There is interactions, but it's not synchrotron radiation. So that's a bit about the accelerator and how we get this huge luminosity. A bit about the, ex the experiment now before I show the results at the end of the talk. So it's, it's a big collaboration. It's about a third of the size of the LHC experiments, and it takes people from all over the world. Um, there's uh, uh, around 50 of us from India working on this, various universities and TIFR, and it's split between Europe and America also. There's also, this plot was made not in recent times, but Russia is singled out here. That's not on purpose now that we have to treat them so differently. This was done before for other reasons. Um, you, I don't want to go into the politics of this, but this is causing huge problems at the moment for us. But um, we currently are not submitting any papers. So it's uh, like, like it is for everybody. But of course, we feel for our Ukrainian group that's here. So the detector is uh, quite big not huge, it's five meters tall and about seven and a half meters long, and has a very similar structure to Bell and actually reuses the magnet, which is one of the very expensive pieces, 1.2 Tesla solenoid, um, which causes curvature of the charge track so we can measure the momentum. But we have an entirely new silicon vertex detector in here which has larger acceptance and much better precision. We have new particle identification, this time of flight and aerogel, counters here. We have the same calorimeter, which is a very precise crystal calorimeter, so all the energy of the photon is absorbed, and you get a good measurement of, of, of the photon energy, and hence pi zeros. Um, and because of the rearrangement of the detectors, and particularly the magnets that have come in to do this squeezing of the beam, we've had to make a new drift chamber, which is just a wire, a wire chamber, but it's got a uh, smaller cell size to better protect against backgrounds that come off these beams. So I just want to highlight one part of this, which is the silicon vertex detector. Um, this uh, was not entirely made in India, but partially made in India. One of these layers of the silicon vertex detector, which is designed to make those precise measurements of the decay position of the bees and allow these time-dependent measurements, as well as do tracking of low-momentum particles. Uh, there are layers of pixels in here, but then there are layers of strip silicon detectors. And this layer four was entirely built by a group of Indian institutions led by Tata Institute, which uh, uh, one of my earlier PhD students, Resmi, uh, contributed to the construction and commissioning of this detector. And we're now involved with the operations of this, which I'll tell you about operations, I think, in the next slide. Yeah, so this is our luminosity, the thing we really care about and how we've integrated it since we started in 2019. So I uh, don't ignore this, I've put the years here, so this is 2020 and 2021. So as with all new machines, um, you have a slow start. You're trying to get as much luminosity in a short period of time. Um, and we've slowly been increasing, and you see we're accumulating data at faster and faster rates. The gaps are due to um, the fact we can only run for six months of the year. To accelerate particles is expensive in terms of wall power of electricity. Every time these electrons and positrons go around, they lose energy. You have to accelerate them with an RF system again. So in the summer, when um, they're using the most electricity in Japan for air conditioning, we don't run. We now have problems that we have to truncate our run because of energy uh, <laughs> crisis, but that's uh, another story. So, we, so far, we've accumulated around 250 inverse femtobonds, which is a third of the Bell data set. And we hope to get towards over half of it before we stop in the summer. Um, but note, we were taking data throughout the pandemic. So we were running this detector um, in Japan uh, and, and all the sub-detectors around it. The accelerator was running, and we were running the, 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 the detectors. So for this vertex detector, for example, I was sat at my dining table in Chennai, but had the ability to operate the silicon vertex detector. I could ramp up the voltage, ramp it down, put it in or out of data taking. So we devised systems to allow us to keep on running. Of course, we were heavily reliant on our Japanese colleagues who worked in difficult conditions to keep this going. But um, it, it still worked, and we're some way going some way forward with our data taking. But we're still a long way away from that 50 inverse atobans we want to ultimately collect. 
So in the last 10 minutes, um, I'm just going to talk about three recent results. Uh, that actually, our three most recent papers from Bell 2 um, to show that we're now producing physics papers, and, and, they, uh, um, and, and they have quite a lot of interest, particularly the last one. So first one of these just showcases our silicon vertex detector. We, we, we've measured the lifetime for D mesons uh, more precisely than anyone else has done this before. So these lifetime measurements um, test models of QCD, essentially, uh, uh, of how these D, D mesons should decay when you integrate over all their possible final states. And the most precise measurement was actually done 20 years ago by an experiment in Fermilab called FOCUS. And, and it's been used as a reference for all other lifetime measurements. So there was a desire to improve this or at least double check that that measurement was correct. So as I mentioned before, we don't just make Bs, we make charm quarks as well. So E plus E minus goes to CC bar. And they tend to produce a, what's called a D star meson, which decays to a, a neutral D and a, a slow pion. So you can make a vertex where the D is produced and where, where the D star is produced at the, the interaction point, and then the D flies some distance, and then decays. So you can measure both of these things. And then just using a bit of geometry about the position of the decay and the momentum of the decay, you can relate this back to the time it took to travel, if you know its momentum. So we go on to measure the decay products and measure its momentum. So this relates you back to the time. And of course, this is a boosted time, so that's why the momentum's in here. And what this plot here shows you is the distribution of the time of these decays. So the left side, these negative times are things to do with the resolution of the detector, and the stuff on the right-hand side, which is going out to larger values, are real decays that happened away from the interaction point here. And then fitting this very carefully, taking into account the background, you can make a precise estimate of the lifetime. So these are measurements of the lifetime. It sounds very short. It's like about around one picosecond. Um, to seconds, but we're measuring this to the order of one femtosecond for the D0, and the D plus, due to higher backgrounds, is measured somewhat less precisely. So this shows how the vertex detector is working. This would not have been possible with Bell, and that's why it wasn't done until we had Bell 2. We need very little data to do this, because there are so many charm quarks produced. So now I want to talk about a CP vi Yeah, just more precise. There's no, no problem. Um, so, yeah, that going back to my unitarity triangles, one of the key components of making a more precise um, between the one affected by loops and the one affected by that it's unaffected is pure standard model, we think, the tree one, and no loops, is, is to measure this angle phi 3. And here in Chennai, um, Niharika, who, whose viva was on Monday, uh, has made this measurement, which is the first measurement of uh, CP violating parameter at Bell 2, and is of this phi 3 parameter, which was published in JHEP earlier this year. So what we're doing here is measuring this phi 3 angle, or gamma, which relies upon the interference between two different decays uh, of, of, of a, a B to a D0 and a K on and a D0 bar to a K on, which have these quark constant given here. And um, this one depends on this VUB matrix element, because you've got the B quark transitioning to an up quark. So you pick up this standard model CP violating phase, phi 3. Now, this delta B and this RB are QCD parameters, which are a nuisance to us, but we can actually measure them as well in the data. So we extract those as well, so we don't have to worry about any predictions. So this is very theoretically clean. So as long as your D0 and your D0 bar decay to the same final state, all of this will interfere, and you can get access to this phi 3 parameter. So there's a very uh, interesting technique that was proposed a long time ago and, and then finally been implemented both by Bell, Bell 2, and LHCB, where we can measure this using a final state of the D0 going to a, a K short, normally a pi plus and a pi minus, but we also use K plus and K minus. And it's a Dalitz plot, and I'll show that in a moment. And what's particularly novel about Niharika's analysis is we've actually merged the Bell data and the Bell 2 data, because we're not going to have much more than uh, Bell for a while, but we can at least reduce our uncertainties by a fact, uh, 40% or so by combining the two data sets and using improved analysis techniques. Uh, and this, there'll be many more of these in the next couple of years. So just to guide you through this, 
This is uh, what we look for first is our signal, which is here in red, um, against the background. And this is using a kinematic variable that relies upon knowledge of the, um, uh, the, the fixed knowledge of the beams beforehand and the energy of the beam meson when it's been reconstructed. It's called this, the difference between these two, and it should be zero for a signal. This peak here is a decay of B to D pi, and is offset kinematically due to the um, mass difference between the pion and the kaon. So we can separate these kinematically. But this is a superb control sample because it doesn't exhibit CP violation, so we can use that to calibrate everything. Then this is our Dalitz plot, which is the invariant mass of the K short with one pi on, on one axis, so the pi minus up here, and the K short with a pi plus down here. So this is a symmetric Dalitz plot. And we bin our data in this Dalitz plot. Why we choose these bins is because they have certain values of those strong phase parameters, which can help us get different amounts of CP violation in the different bins. And we can therefore extract both phi 3 and these hadronic parameters, RB and delta B, in one measurement. So this is uh, the asymmetry, the CP asymmetry, between uh, the B plus and the B minus decaying. And you see it wiggles around this line of 0 here. And if there was no CP violation, it should all agree with this line. So it's not too impressive in this plot, I agree. But once you do the statistical analysis and you measure the value of phi 3, you get something that's significantly away from 0. And we measure phi 3 to be around uh, nearly 80 degrees with an uncertainty of around 11 degrees, which is much more precise than we managed at the earlier, with the earlier data and because of largely the techniques that we've introduced. So we've reanalyzed the Bell data and improved the measurement by, statistically, it's about a factor of two by just adding this little bit of data and improved techniques. So in my last five minutes, I will move to the hot topic in, in flavor physics, maybe some would say in particle physics, and this is what's so-called B anomalies. These are flavor-changing neutral currents where you have a B quark turning to a strange quark. So these are both quarks with minus a third charge. So that's why it's called a neutral current. And then it has two leptons in the final state. So our final Feynman diagrams that can do this, one is called a penguin diagram, um, where you have a W and most often a top in the standard model. And similarly, you can have a box diagram where you have a top and a neutrino. Now, why this is a penguin diagram is an interesting story. So John Ellis, who visited us pre-pandemic, so a long time ago, he came up with the idea of a, a penguin diagram to basically win a bet. He'd lost a darts match, so he had to get the word penguin in his next paper. And he reckoned that this looks like a penguin. Yeah, uh, you, can, you can read more about this, and you realize why he might have imagined it looked like a penguin. Uh, so this is one class of anomalies. These things are not agreeing with what we expect in the standard model. And then there's another type as well, where we have uh, a B to C transition, which is the most favored. And then the W produces a tau lepton and a neutrino. And this can be compared to the muon. You can make a ratio. And this ratio is not agreeing with what we expect. So these two types of anomalies, um, this B to SLL, because it's purely loops, has huge reach in terms of higher mass scales, much beyond what we can look for directly at the LHC. Unfortunately, only LHCB has seen this so far. So we always like to see confirmation between two different experiments. Whereas this beta C tau nu anomaly has been seen by Bell, Babar, and LHCB. And this is much easier at Bell 2 because of this neutrino. So we are the experiment that's supposed to finally see whether this is true or not. Now, the interesting thing potentially about this anomaly is the new physics must be much lighter. It has to be at the electroweak scale, which is around the mass of the W, which is 100 GeV or so. So it's much lighter new physics. And that's hard to explain, um, given all those limits that have been set at the energy frontier. So this is more problematic theoretically to describe. Here, there are many, many possible new physics explanation. Um, the rates don't agree with the prediction. It's just a ratio. I, I'll talk about um, this one. I don't have time to talk about this. I have it in the backup. So what, what we measure is you measure the rate of um, the decay, where H here is a K, K on or a K star for this B to K mu mu over B to K ee. And in the standard model, 
we expect the rates of these two to be almost exactly the same because there's something called lepton universality where the electron and the muon couple with the same strength to the W, the Z, and the photon. So this can be really well predicted and all the theory uncertainties, or not all, most of the theory uncertainties drop out in this because all the things to do with form factors are the same because that's on the quark side and the new physics is on the lepton side. So this is predicted to a few percent. So this is a really good observable to try and challenge with a precision measurement. So LHCB have done this, um, and, and this is their control channel where they have uh, a J psi, which decays to two leptons. It has charm quarks in it, so it's produced a lot from Bs. And you see here their B mass peaks. You also see this is not a Monte Carlo or a simulation. They have barely any background beneath this. But you do notice that their electron resolution is very broad. Uh, and this is a cause of concern uh, that there might be some problem here. And that, that's due to the fact that the electrons, as they pass through the material of the detector, are likely to radiate photons. And you don't reconstruct all of those photons, so-called Bremsstrahlung photons. When they do this on this mode away from the J psi, they see the muons very clearly. They also can see a nice electron peak as well. And they take the ratio between these two, and they do not get one. They get around three standard deviations below for the k -on, and then there are two different measurements where they're getting around two standard deviations below. So that in itself is not very interesting. Three is very interesting uh, in one measurement. So these are the LHCB results. They're not so, uh, they're, they're not Bell 2, so I'll move quickly over these and just describe what people think might be going on. So you can actually make many, many more uh, measurements, particularly for the K star case. You have lots of angular observables that you can measure, and in fact, uh, all these experiments, um, as LHCB including these, have measured about 250 different observables that are sensitive to this BSLL process. Um, and there are other variables related to very rare decays of, of Bs to the analog of that K-long that I started with in a B meson going to two muons, which is also related. And what you can do is you use... Um, expansion where you have something called Wilson coefficients where you integrate out those heavy mass scales and you just have like point interactions like old school Fermi theory in nuclear physics if you're familiar with that where you integrate out the W and, and, and you can see how much new physics is required in these observables with these four, four fermion operators here so this is the S quark, the B quark and the two leptons this is a different one with a different chiral structure I'm, 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 you see, this is the best fit, is if there was no new physics, it would be here, but it's some way away. And the, these fits will show you, depending on the assumptions that you make, you can get anywhere between six and seven standard deviations from these anomalies. So this is all very exciting, but it's not one single measurement, and the whole picture is not entirely clear yet. So what Bell 2 has managed to do is to measure a complementary process, which is the B going to the S, but not to charged leptons, but to neutral leptons. And this was published last year. So this has one of these diagrams contributing, this so-called penguin diagram, because we just need the Z here. We can't have the box diagram. Um, so this essentially, if there's new physics contributing, it would contribute in some different way in this measurement. So there's a pre reasonably precise 10% or so standard model prediction for this, which we can compare to. And we developed a technique um, which uses machine learning to basically differentiate between our different types of events. So if you have BB bar events, all the decay products come out relatively isotropically over the 4 pi solid angle. QQ bar events, they're collimated with one another because they go out back to back to one another. But in these events where you have two neutrinos, you have some weird intermediate topology, which is distinct from these two. So we trained on simulated samples which are calibrated on data which were then calibrated uh, in data, with data samples. So it's a data-driven approach, and we could distinguish this, um, this, this final state. And unfortunately, the, the variable that comes out is one of these multivariate discriminatives. It's a boosted decision tree. Um, but uh, the, the, the signal would peak up here, and backgrounds would peak down here. So this has been uh, carefully validated.
So, okay. Once you trust, right? We, we, these other experiments don't have the precision. Though there are some interesting variables that are measured by Bell that are not measured by LHCB. This pink circle in behind, that's LHCB. The whole thing is driven by one experiment. Okay? So your question of trust is whether other experiments will see the same effect. Yeah? So trust is a prediction. Standard, this is saying if, if standard model is there, these Wilson coefficients, they're relatively straightforward to calculate. They would predict that there could be no, so this is a Wilson, uh, the Wilson coefficient you measure less the prediction. And whatever's away from zero is not coming from anything we know about in the standard model. I can't tell you what it is. It's just because we've integrated out this, this heavy degree of freedom. So this is like effective field theory type approach. So yeah. So what, what's interesting is we're, we're getting to a level now with this. It's, it was, it was uh, a quite precise upper limit with a very small amount of data around 10 times less than previous experiments. And we're updating this at the moment, and we, we, we will potentially be able to measure the standard model value. And whether that disagrees or not with the prediction will be a key indicator as to whether these anomalies are really... Uh, a lot of complementary information about these anomalies. And if it's different from the standard model prediction, I think people will really start to believe that this is something new because it's in a completely different process to this B to SLL. So um, essentially, I'm telling you here to stay tuned. Sorry, I've gone over time a few minutes. Um, so what I've tried to tell you about today are these complementary approaches to how we're tackling the problems of particle physics and these three frontiers. And intensity frontier is where flavor physics is going and how, in the past, we've helped push the standard model to where it is today, and we hope to push it with uh, some new physics discoveries in the years ahead. So this will, of course, be done not just by us, but also by LHCB and also ATLAS and CMS. The large detectors at the LHC are becoming more and more interested in B physics because we're seeing these differences away from the standard model. And there's a huge amount of resources going into that in the next runs of the LHC. So by the summer, we'll have this data set, which is roughly the size of what Babar had and half the size of Bell 2. Then we're shutting down for some work on the detector and the accelerator, and we'll start again in late 2023. And from there, we'll push through to the next decade. Particle physics is a long business to try and reach our 50 inverse atabines. So just to leave you with a few, I've got two slides left, both with big images on to see if you're still awake. So this uh, neuron diagram was created for the so-called snow mass process in the US, where, which is once a decade they define the, the program for particle physics. But these neurons that come out here are supposed to show different areas of flavor physics and QCD physics here, and also this dark matter stuff, the tau physics. Um, these are all different things we can do here. You can't read any of this. But what I told you today are just three of these things. So there's a huge program of work that goes on at Bell 2 that keeps the thousands of us busy. Um, and one can expect to hear much more about Bell 2 in the years ahead. Now, if I have made you interested about flavor physics at all, and you are a student or a postdoc, we are actually running a school um, at ICTS, uh, not at ICTS. We were, I think we will be one of the last online experiences. But it's all about flavor physics, and we've got uh, eight lecturers who will introduce various aspects of what we've been talking about in much more detail. So if you're interested, please register. To finish with the flavorful theme, you can see how we've done our advertising here. OK, so thank you very much. That's, that's all I have to say today. Thank you, Professor Libby, for the nice talk and a very wide uh, if you should have any questions, um, you should. Okay. Here is must have got to work on. The ambulance was chased.
Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, so to, to explain both anomaly simultaneously is hard. However, uh, a theory that went out of fashion has come back, which is a leptoquark, where you have a, posit a new set of particles which are, have lepton numbers and quark numbers, and can have color and can have this. So these, there is a lepton quark, leptoquark diagram which could enhance that B to C tau nu rate. And it'd be exclusively, well, just between the second and third generation. It can't have anything in the first generation, otherwise we would have seen it somewhere else. So that's, to my knowledge, the only theory that seems to be working with um, all the anomalies together. B to SLL, essentially you can, whatever you want, whether it be supersymmetry or additional Higgs sector, the gauge symmetry, Z primes, all of this is possible there. So uh, people like an extra gauge symmetry, a new force type thing where you'd have a new Z prime, which would be introduced in that box diagram and not, not elsewhere, and it would be at a mass scale that's so high that we would never have seen it at LEP or anything like this, and it's not being produced at the LHC because, again, it's so heavy that it's, it's not within the kinematic reach of the LHC. Jim, uh, talking in quantum mechanics, so these particles, let's say B0 bar to B0 transition, ah. it is spontaneous, correct? Well, it goes through this box diagram. So it's not spontaneous, it's happening. But as it, as it propagates, it, it, it oscillates yeah, the, via the box. So, yeah, so I think uh, D0 has a very less uh, rate compared to yes. B. B is very uh, almost spontaneous, they claim, in quantum mechanics. So, uh, the I'm thing not quite is sure what you mean by spontaneous. It has a time associated with it. There's a, the mixing rate is no. We measure the frequency of the mixing. Uh, and we measure the mixing frequency in charm quarks now as well. X and Y are measured really well. So we, we, we know. So uh, that's what I think. Uh, so the, the question uh, actually led from here is, uh, what is the definition of a particle? So In terms of, you mean B-mixing, the fact yeah. that you can turn from a B0 to a B0 bar, these yeah. delta B equal 2. Yeah. Um, as they're composite, it's okay, right? I can write down a diagram that, in the standard model which converts. And because there's this small mass difference between the two weak eigenstates, the light and the heavy, I, can, uh, I, I, I get the mixing. Okay, so there's no issue here that I'm violating matter and antimatter because mixing is here because it's it's not a fundamental uh, particle. I, I I do it through that box and that box rate uh, you calculate this and given the mass of the top quark you predict the mixing rate. And similarly, the charm mixing is driven by the the bottom quark mass. The mixing loop. So these all come out and they they're all predicted reasonably well. Demixing less so because there are long range effects where you can get it going to two pions, decaying to two pions, and then the two pions merge to form a D. So that's a long range effect because there's hadronization there. So that's maybe what you mean by spontaneous short range yeah. and long range. So okay. I, I, I don't exactly recall. I think, you know, when I'm saying that I'm turning a B0 into B0 bar, it looks like I'm violating uh, matter, antimatter, right? But in fact, I'm not because I've got two quarks that have changed. So the overall baryon number, yeah. which is, is, it remains the same. So, so the idea that what I asked is because I, Jim may correct me. So the idea is if you talk about quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics will tell you that the transition between this flavor, this is what is called oscillation, flavor oscillation, B0 to B and B to B0. And this, uh, uh, what I know, is uh, supposed to be spontaneous in case of B meson. And if that is true, then which one is a particle and which one is antiparticle? It's actually the same guy. So the entire definition of a particle and antiparticle but, is but completely they're, they're, No, no, they're CP conjugate. Thing. So as soon as one of them decays, you know, unless it's going to uh, an eigenstate. Of, Jim, I think that is true for D meson, but I am talking here B0 to B0, B. semi-leptonic decay. If I know it's going to, the charge of the lepton tells me unambiguously what it is at that time. And I can also know how it was formed by tagging the other B. So I know what it was born as, and I know what it dies as, 
and hence I know whether it's mixed or unmixed. Because what I think is B decays very, very fast compared to the rest of the D0 and other stuff. Bs, that's why the confusion was. What is the definition of a particle? When they uh, try okay. to I, I, I think it's, kind of, it's clear to me. I know which one's the one with the B, B quark and the other is the B minus. That's clear. But um, neutral mesons, this is not, not an issue. Okay? Okay. As far as I'm aware. Jim, here. Yes, sir, here. Uh, so, um, what is the distribution of uh, antimatter in the universe? We know that, you know, so, stars um, and uh, galaxies are matter, but... Yeah. Uh, so, 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 there are various things that have been measured. There's a famous experiment called AMS, which sits on... Um, the International Space Station, which measures the relative number of protons to antiprotons in cosmic rays. And the ratio there is small. It's like 10 to the minus 6. Though you can locally produce, with higher energy cosmic rays, you can easily produce a proton-antiproton press. So you expect some antiprotons. But the rate is suppressed. But what we do know is that the ratio of matter to photons in the universe is, I think, around 10 to the minus 9. Yep. If there had been no CP asymmetry, the ratio between matter and photons would be 10 to the minus 18, as would the ratio of antimatter to photons. So there would be matter and antimatter around. So the abundance of matter relative to photons is telling us somewhere the antimatter disappeared. And in the early universe, there was a time when Things dropped out of equilibrium, and there was a process that took place that essentially violated what we consider baryon number today. And so disappeared, so we, disappeared in the sense of energy lost? Not energy lost. It's just there was a preferential decay to matter. Okay. So that the, the process which was in equilibrium was producing more matter than antimatter, and that had to come from CP violation. And we can do this to a tiny level in the lab, but we cannot do it to the extent that's required. But the, these theories in neutrinos, which are called leptogenesis, it's a big, big claim, can actually drive the whole matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe. And if we see CP violation in neutrinos, that would be a hint of that. But it would, it's, a, it's a very different scale at very early times in the universe. So it's hard for us to probe experimentally because the energies are so large. But that's where so, we are. So, so the antimatter that existed at the beginning of the universe is not the same now. Yeah, it's gone. And then the empirical piece of evidence, because people argued that maybe the universe is clumpier than we think. Maybe bits of the universe are made of antimatter and bits are made of matter, and we've just been fooling ourselves because it looks largely symmetric. But there would be a place where the two interface with one another, and you would be expecting a background of very high energy gamma rays coming from such an interface between these two parts of the universe. And that, of course, has not been observed. So that's why we think the universe we see, even back to the earliest times, is matter dominated. And this matter dominance happened behind that CMB radiation point where we, we can't see anymore how it happened. And it, it probably happened in the very earliest, you know, within, I think, minus 20 or something I hear, but I can't remember. I, you may remember the timescales better when the matter antimatter. Very much less. Yeah, very much less. Weinberg's book. I can look that bit up. So the cosmic uh, microwave background experiment doesn't give a direct evidence of uh, how much of uh, antimatter has been lost, right? Interesting talk. So it gives size our uh, <laughs> basic concept of particle physics. Okay, what we read in master's level. So I have a general question regarding this uh, all types of particle detector. We have the CMS son and uh, CMS detector and this Atlas detector, Barber, and now you are talking about this Bell 2 detector. 
So, how can you understand this? So, all the uh, objective, all the detectors are the same or they are all the competitor or they are the parallel set of detector. So, how can you, in layman language, how can you understand all these uh, particle detectors in terms of efficiency or... So, so, so it's, it's, it's specialization, mm -hmm. okay? So, um, CMS and ATLAS are detectors designed to measure new things, mm -hmm. primarily the Higgs boson, at very high energies. So we're talking about TV collisions there, okay. whereas Bell 2 is at 10 GV. So that immediately means particles are much slower, lower energy. So you need to have different detectors which are sensitive to those lower energy particles. Okay. Mm -hmm. So many ATLAS and CMS measurements cut off at GVs, that's their lower limit. Whereas that would, we'd lose everything. We have very few GV particles in our detector. So the detectors are designed to measure things at the appropriate energy scale. And they're looking for different things. So this is this intensity energy frontier. Okay. In the intensity frontier, you've got a well controlled and well understood process. You've got my Upsilon 4S, I know it decays to Bs. I'm just trying to produce more and more and more to do that statistical measurement. At the LHC, it was you know, let's do this, let's push the frontier, let's see if we can produce something new. So they're complementary to one another. Now, a more controversial statement, have they turned the camera off? <laughs> it's the LHC experiments because they've seen nothing and they're going to run for another, well, there are hints of various things, but they're going to run for another 15 years. They are also doing precision measurements now. A lot of this next run is about measuring the Higgs boson very precisely. They are also doing intensity frontier physics, though they like to still call themselves energy frontier physics. But they're measuring things very precisely and looking for discrepancies. That's really what we're doing now because we don't have the technology at present to make that big step forward, another order of magnitude, to start looking for new particles of 10 TV mass. It's talked about, there's something called FCCHH, which would be built at uh, near CERN and have a 100 kilometer diameter, um, not diameter circumference ring compared with around 21 for LHC. That might possibly be able to do this, but we're talking about 2080s for that to be realizable. So I'll just be happy to be here at that point. <laughs> and one hypothetical question, is there any plan of any particle detector to be set in India? Or there is so the, the, there is a neutrino experiment that has been much talked about since I came to India called the uh, in, Indian Neutrino Observatory or the ICAL, mm -hmm. which um, would be sitting under an overburden of rock to filter out cosmic rays and then measure neutrinos from the atmosphere. That is the biggest indigenous project. They've had problems finding a home. Okay. Mm -hmm. Their home was in Tamil Nadu for a while, but that seems to be becoming less likely now. Uh, they may move to the Himalaya. So I, uh, it's still on the cards, but it's been very hard to get it moving. Okay. So that would, that would be it. There are some talk of some smaller things, measuring dark matter, measuring neutrinos, double beta decay. Again, these are smaller scale experiments, but there is nothing on terms of colliders. There's no accelerator program to build a collider in India at present. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, for this nice talk. Uh, uh, just said there is a fourth kind of neutrinos, fourth ah. generation of neutrinos. So, um, if uh, sectors, there could be fourth generation of quarks, and so uh, the in the so the uh, already the measured uh, elements generation of quarks are there. So, so there are, yeah, there. I think there are two questions there. So on, on the neutrino uh, anomaly you're talking about, uh, there are, there are a certain set of neutrino experiments, uh, largely based on low energy beams, 
uh, which have seen an effect that can only be described if you include a fourth neutrino, but it gets given the name sterile. Yeah. Yeah? Yes. So that tells you that it's not coupling to the standard model in the same way as the other neutrinos. It's already different. It's not really another generation as such as we have in the standard model where they have the same couplings to the W, mm -hmm. all right? So that fourth generation in the neutrinos could be something entirely different, and it doesn't necessarily have to have a quark partner because it's just in neutrinos, weak interaction. You know, why should it have anything to do with the quarks? Of course, in a grand unified theory, you on to fourth generation, and people talked a lot about this for a long time, T primes and things and B primes. The experimental evidence uh, for the various things, the non-closure of the unitarity triangle, it's very, it would lead to that unitarity triangle being open, essentially, and, and, and it looks very closed. It's, um, so it's, it, the theories that try to explain flavor anomalies uh, and things fall into traps when they try and add a fourth generation because they would have unitarity triangle. Because if you've got a four by four unitary matrix, you've got a whole load of other phases that you can add in. Okay, you can absorb two more, but you've got more from the unitarity, and, and you should be seeing odd CP violating effects among the, the generations, and it's just not there. So the fourth quark would be, again, have to be sterile in some way in terms of how it mixes with the, the ones that we already have. And this is less appealing aesthetically, right? You, if you have a fourth generation, why is it so different? Okay. okay. It, might be, it might be true. That, I'm an experimentalist. I don't worry about these things too much, but um, it, it's got less appeal. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we're not person to ask. I don't know. That's these things are really sterile. So, 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 yeah, most people, so, 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 so there are theories where they're very, very massive ones as well, which would have very different behavior, would not be ultra relativistic. Not, I'm not the person to ask about this. He will give you a much better answer. Hi. Hi. So thanks for, for this talk. So uh, you just uh, explaining about the CP violation. So uh, this CP violation is mainly generalized CP violation means weak interaction and as well as uh, strong interaction you are talking here. No. So um, it's a purely weak effect. Um, many measurements that are purely strong indicate strong interaction is CP symmetric. So any collision or any process that's dominated by the strong interaction, you see no evidence for any CP violation to high yes. order. And this is an issue. It's something called the strong CP puzzle that for whatever reason there, you know, you have three colors. You could have in principle generated some CP violation in the quark sector amongst the three different colors of quarks, but it's identically zero. So some people add a 19th parameter to the standard model, which is the theta strong, the CP violating phase in the strong sector, which seems to be zero. Now, um, yeah, that has some interesting consequences. But uh, basically, the strong interaction is CP symmetric, as far as we can tell empirically. Yeah, actually, uh, but uh, for uh, non-zero neutron uh, electric dipole moment and magnetic dipole moment tells I, us... I can't hear you very well, Cyan. Yeah. yeah. The non-zero neutron electric dipole moment and magnetic ah, dipole no, moment. but we've not measured, no? Local CP. But globally, then it's, it's conserved. Ah. Actually, it's I know, but if you're talking local, then we're not talking, because somewhere else that means yeah, the opposite Yeah, is this happening. is locally, not globally. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, I'm with you. Yeah. That's different, yeah, yeah. because, yeah. So, uh, so here, uh, that asymmetry you are talking, that, 
asymmetry and it uh, if this is a non zero so it simplifies that uh, there could be cp violations right yeah so yeah. n plus minus n minus by the total so so, so an example the textbook example of this is actually from neutral kaons where you have a semi leptonic decay of a um, long lived neutral kaon the k long in going to uh, it would be a pi plus an, an electron and a new anti neutrino. And then if you look at the CP conjugate of that, still a K long going to a pi minus and a positron and a neutrino, the rate of those two decays are different. So in fact, you produce more positrons than electrons in that given decay. That's a distinct difference between matter and antimatter. That's not local. It's really producing more of one type than another. It's the wrong way around for what we want to do, but it's not. Uh, but that's true of the particular process. Yeah, so so that, 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 that's that's what we mean by CP violation. There's a real difference between matter and how matter and antimatter's behavior. So uh, the reason of that asymmetry not equal to zero, that number of positive charge and negative charge, that uh, could yeah. be not same. So I know that uh, one uh, reason is uh, chirality imbalance. So is there any other reason that could affect of that? This has got nothing to do with chirality. This is matter antimatter, not left and right. Because when we are talking about in uh, strong interactions, so that chirality imbalance uh, tells us that uh, asymmetry, uh, which is not equal to zero. Sure, sure but this is. This is local effect in the QCD. It's not a global effect in, the, in, in an interaction like it is in the weak sector. It's not creating more matter than antimatter, right? That's what I mean by CP violation. You can have local CP violation. That's possible. That's absolutely possible. But once you integrate over the whole, it has to go away. Let's thank the speaker again. Um, may I request Professor Shiram to present a memento to the speaker? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all for coming. Session is closed.